continue our adventure this morning, uh, looking closely at the teachings of Jesus in the book of Mark, and our text for today's message is found in Mark chapter 9, 42 to 50. And um, in this particular passage, uh, Jesus continues to dialogue with his disciples concerning their issue of understanding what is greatness in the kingdom of God. And uh, Jesus has identified the natural desire his 12 disciples had to uh, climb the ladder of success, you, you might say, and to have prestige in their positions as his chosen 12 disciples. And, and how, um, suggesting contrary to these flesh-driven desires, uh, whoever wants to be great in the kingdom of God must actually become a humble servant and give their life in service to other people and to the Lord. So God's path to spiritual greatness is, in fact, uh, to love and protect the vulnerable and uh, those that are, are, are maybe uh, not able to uh, speak for themselves um, to, to, to take care of those people, to make sure that when we see those that are broken on the road of life, that we, we stop and we load them onto our ride and we take them to the end and we care for them. This is, this is what loving our neighbor as ourself is. Jesus explained that in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Today, we're going to be continuing with that theme in the back of our minds. We're going to be continuing to read from Mark chapter 9, verse 40. Actually, we're going to start with 41. So um, before we start here, let's just bow in prayer. Jesus, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you, God, that there is life in your word. And God, as I explain what you've laid on my heart today from this passage, God, I pray that people's hearts would be stirred towards you and that all eyes would be upon you, Jesus, and that hearts and lives would be encouraged and strengthened in their faith. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus starts by saying in verse 41, Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. So having this power kind of struggle through telling the disciples that their idea of greatness was askew and they needed to humble themselves, Jesus continues um, by saying how appropriate it was. And this is greatness. This is talking about greatness in the kingdom of God. It is appropriate to show kindness to others in Jesus' name. God does not just remember the gift, but he remembers heart behind the gift. Now, when you think of giving a cup of water to someone in Jesus' name, I mean, that seems like a, a small thing, right? Well, unless you're, maybe you're in the desert dying of thirst or, you know, you're going to die without it. But generally speaking, giving someone a cup of water is, you know, it's something that everybody can do. It's, very, it's a very thoughtful and kind act, but not difficult or beyond the power of everyday people to provide. Now, when we are God's children, and whoever cares for us shows kindness to the children of the King of Kings. And this is what this is saying here. Jesus is saying, God notices small things that we do for each other in the right heart. See, because it's not always the big things that matter. Yes, big things do matter, but not always just the big things. It's the little things in life. It's the way that we treat one another in little ways. that It all compounds. And God doesn't just want us to focus on, you know, the things that draw maybe accolades or the appearance of, of being righteous. He wants us to be righteous from the heart because of love for our fellow uh, believers for, for fellow Christians and for others, but in this particular case, it's directed towards uh, those who belong to the Messiah. And um, Isaiah the prophet said it well in Isaiah chapter 58, the, 
the first part of 58 in 9 to 11, he prophesies, if you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing of finger and malicious talk, if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. Doesn't that hit you? He will strengthen your frame. You'll be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Interesting, isn't that? What a beautiful scripture. This is how God uh, deals with his children, spiritually speaking. And you know, you can provide a cup of cold water spiritually to a brother or sister in Christ who is thirsty. See, Christ cares for the little things. And he wants us to be like-minded as unto him. So that when we do little things, we do it as unto the Lord, but we do it out of love for our fellow believers. Don't ever think that you don't have anything to offer. You do. God has called you by name. He has given you life. He's put his spirit within you. You are his child. And everything you do matters. Everything. Even something small, like providing a cup of cold water to another person in Jesus' name when they need it. I would encourage you this morning to think about this. There's people here that are going through hard times. There's people here that have, have faced circumstances. They're broken. Maybe they're dry and parched, and they just need a word of encouragement. They need the word of life. And the Spirit tugs at you and says, do it. Go and do this thing. Say this thing. Don't put that off. The Holy Spirit speaks like this in that still small voice because he knows that you are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. We're going to talk more about that. But the disciples needed to hear this. They had been arguing about who was the greatest among them. Jesus was trying to make a point that even these small acts of kindness done in the right heart were acts of greatness and precious to God. And part of yielding to the Lord was to see these needs of others, to be aware of the needs of others around us and to act on them no matter how small the perception of the act is, right? So he goes on to 42. If anyone causes one of these little ones those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if there was a large millstone, if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. Wow. Going from a cup of cold water to a great warning. In its proper context, this particular verse, um, you can kind of picture the scene, right? Now, last week we talked about this uh, child that Jesus sat with him. And, and, and basically explained that the disciples and their perception of the kingdom of God needed to be more like this child, more innocent, more open, more willing to learn. And, and so Jesus used a little child whom he sat on his knee to illustrate the importance of every person, including children. And, and suggesting to his disciples, rather than seeking power and prestige for what they do or say, um, they should seek to care for and welcome people with little to offer and who are vulnerable like little children. And, and that kind of attitude, pleasing. It's pleasing to God. And uh, it's the heart of greatness. That attitude is the heart of greatness. God is asking his disciples here to embrace it. And, and in verse 42, the Lord goes further with this thought. Now, if you picture, because he had just had this child sitting on his knee, and this is part of the same dialogue, okay? Okay. The Lord goes further with his thought that the child that he's using in his object lesson in verse 36 and 37 of, our, of, of chapter 9 here is still likely sitting in close proximity to him. Maybe the child is still sitting on his lap while he's giving this discourse. And he uses the illustration of innocence of a little child to further emphasize his point. 
Not only are the disciples not to ignore the vulnerable and the young in him, but woe to the person that corrupts innocent people who come to faith in him and causes them to turn away from him. Little ones is often interpreted as referring to the child Jesus presented in this chapter. Um, but I think he had a broader audience in mind using the child as an illustration, just as he had used the child in, a, in an illustration prior to this with a greater audience in mind. The Greek word uh, for this uh, little ones is micros, which can mean someone younger, but it can also mean someone who is of lower rank and lesser experience, like the man whom the 12 disciples considered less important than them because he was not one of them. Remember, just before this, there was a man that was doing miracles in Jesus' name. He was casting out demons in Jesus' name, and they said, you're not one of us. You shouldn't be doing this. So, including someone like him, Jesus is trying to teach his disciples this great lesson. When the disciples told this man to stop because they didn't think he was important enough, they were actually sinning against God, and they were rebuked by the Lord for that. This is part of the lesson, and this is part of our, our learning in, in, in our day and age, too, where we look at what he was teaching the disciples firsthand, and we apply it to our own lives. What Jesus was saying here, it's a horrible thing to cause innocent or young believers in him to stumble in their faith and to turn away. It would be better for this person to be executed by drowning tied to a large millstone for them, than for this to happen. See, some people are Christian only in label. Their hearts have never been changed. And they go around offending, and they go around offending and doing evil. This is a grave thing. God is warning about this. He doesn't want us to have hearts like Pharisees who only look at the letter of things. He wants us to have a connection relationally with him and to, and to be his children and to act as though what we say, what we do, where we go is in, is, is, is in him. We're no longer our own. Now, there's, there's branches of Christianity out there that kind of take certain parts of Christianity and make them legalistic principles but they lose the heart of it. And as a result, they cause people to stumble. They cause people to stumble because the gospel they preach is not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel they preach is a different gospel. It is a gospel of works, not of love and of grace of the Lord. Because when God's grace impacts us, that change inside of us impacts others. If you are a child of God, if you are a true child of God, your life will be changed. And the way that you treat other people will be different than before you came to know God. You see, Christianity isn't just knowing about God. Christianity in its pure form, the way Jesus intended, is knowing God, not just knowing about him. So, there's many people that are religious and they become stumbling blocks to those who really want to know the truth and they turn them away by their behaviors. God, forgive anyone in this position. Help us all to see Jesus for who he really is and to submit to his lordship because there is, there is great punishment in store for those that fail to yield to the message of the gospel. And my friends, God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Now, Jesus was using this illustration likely because there was a connection point with, with the people that were there listening to the story. You see, at about the the time of Jesus' birth, if you remember the census that was taken by when Quirinius was governor of the area, the, go the Roman government, the Roman Empire, called people to return to their hometowns for a census, and their, 
there was a great disdain for this amongst a lot of the Jewish people because they felt as though the Roman authorities were oppressing them. So they, they, uh, there's this guy that they called him Judas the Galilean. He led a massive revolt against the Roman government during the time of the census when Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem to register. He refused to... to uh, to partake in the census, and as a matter of fact, he led an armed rebellion against the government at that time. And even people that decided they were going to go to Bethlehem or to Nazareth or wherever they were, where they were, their ancestors were born to partake in the census, where Judas the Galilean and his followers would burn down those people's houses. And, and there was a great uprising. And it was actually mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles when Gamaliel was talking about Paul and how if it wasn't of God, Paul's ministry would fizzle out like this man, Judas the Galilean, who led this revolt. Now, his followers were theocratic nationalists and um, the sign of the census of the government was a sign of oppression over them and they, and they fought with arms and they were caught. And it says, uh, Josephus gives account of this in the Jewish history book, saying that Judas the Galilean, his, his followers, the leaders of his party, I guess they were his lieutenants or something, they were actually taken out into the Sea of Galilee and were executed by having their ropes tied around their neck and tied to a large millstone which was tossed out of the boat and they all went down to the bottom and, and perished. See, that was a major event in Jesus' time, this would have been discussed by all the people of Galilee. So he was giving this illustration of someone who was, who was taking um, the stand of, of causing an innocent one, uh, uh, someone to stumble. It'd be better for them to be cast into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck. They would all understand what happened to Judas the Galilean's followers. So this was really alive to them. Jesus made this point. He was saying that those who lead young or innocent people astray with false doctrines that turn people away from him will be worse off than this. There is a real heaven, my friends, that God has created to reward those who submit to him. There is a real heaven. It's going to be a glorious thing to be there. And God's desire is that people come to salvation and that they go to this place that he has created. But there will, be, there will be a separation. There is coming a day of judgment. And nobody likes to hear it. But the truth is just as there is a real heaven, there is indeed a real hell. This is why God paid the price that he did with his own blood. Why he made himself a man. And he allowed them to do what they did to him so that he could save us because he wanted to make a way for all of us to be saved from the judgment of hell to follow for those whose hearts are far away from God. The real hell to punish the wicked. What Jesus is saying is that the fires of hell, it's not a place where, where, where he desires people to be. He desires that people be saved. He continues in his teaching in verse 43. He says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Very sobering passage. The first thing I noticed when studying this particular passage is that verse 44 and 46 are missing from the translation I'm speaking from. And, and I just want to make a comment here quickly. It's because the earlier Greek manuscripts used in translating these, the newer versions of the Bible don't have 
the two verses in them, while the later Greek manuscripts used to translate scriptures into the King James versions uh, did include them. I, sh I should mention, however, that there is no new information in these new verses, in these other two verses that changes the meaning of things here. So I would encourage you to read um, and compare. But this passage here is a solemn warning that there is a terrible price to pay for living in the vice of unrepentant sin. Jesus is not advocating self-mutilation here. No, that's not, that's not his point. He, he rather is pre presenting a comparison of severity. It is much more severe to be sentenced to eternal hell than to lose your eyesight or your ability to have mobility in this life. You see, everything here that we go through in this life is temporary. But the life after we leave here is eternal. And there is eternal life in heaven for those whose lives have been saved. Jesus, the Savior, he calls out to people to be saved. There's eternal life for those who are saved. But there is also eternal hell for those who refuse to come. It's a horrible thing to lose an appendage or a limb, right? It's horrible. Being crippled is no fun. Um, you, know, I, you guys know me a little bit. You know that since I've pa been pastored here, I had a uh, an industrial accident with a skill saw. I cut off half of my right thumb. And it was amputated, and they tried to put it back on. I really suffered terribly through that. And, and you know something? I really miss having <laughs> this half of my thumb. I really do. I, uh, yeah, and, and it has a dull ache. You know, I go out in the cold, and... And it gets really cold fast, and it aches all the time. Very rarely do I not notice it. It's always aching. You get used to it after a while. Some, you get used to it. But it still aches. And part of my handicap is that now I drop things more easily, and I have a hard time gripping things with this hand and holding on to things and doing up buttons or a chore. I get my wife to do my buttons up sometimes. <laughs> but you get used to that, and I've learned to accept that. But... What Jesus is telling his disciples here is that the consequences are so much far worse entering eternity in a lost state than being seriously maimed or injured physically while here in this body. Jesus goes on to explain in, in verse 49. He says this. He says, everyone will be salted with fire. Wow. Now, I looked at this and I'm going, okay, well, what are you trying to say through this? This is actually one of the most difficult verses in the book of Mark uh, to, to explain um, or to interpret, I guess. There, through the commentaries, you read, there's so many different takes on this. Um, over a dozen different interpretations of this verse can be found that I found in different commentaries. I believe that one interpretation, however, of these 12 that I found um, seems to rise up above the others as the likely meaning here. Now, when you consider salt, okay, consider the nature of salt. Salt, it acts as a preservative. It acts as a cleansing agent, killing, or I guess, drawing out infection so that bacteria doesn't um, do its work and, and continue damaging the infected part. So, like, with my thumb here, right? They put... Uh, they put some uh, stuff. I, I, I remember with my infection, one of the instructions was to soak it in salt water. Right? So I did that, and it helped. It really did. So, so when you think about the nature of salt, everyone who comes to believe in Jesus will be cleansed of their sin and given the promised Holy Spirit. That is scripture. When you come to Jesus, it's like he takes all of that sin and just, it is taken away, and cast, it says in the scriptures, as far as the east is to, from the west, never to be remembered again. And God deposits his presence inside of you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And 
when you think about this, the spirit whose presence continues cleans and preserves the believer as a sacrifice that is pleasing to God. The Bible calls us living sacrifices as Christians. The Holy Spirit shares the characteristics of both fire and salt. He's holy, and his holiness uh, cleanses and fills the believer with his holy fire. And this holy fire is a cleansing agent. When you come to believe in Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes inside, there is a cleansing flow. I guess we, there's an old hymn that talks about a clen- the cleansing flow of the presence of, G- of the Holy Spirit living in the believer, made possible by the, the, the sacrificial work of Jesus. The holy fire of God is a cleansing agent. It purges the host of the infection of sin, just as the presence of salt deals with bacteria by drawing out the infection. The presence of the Holy Spirit in the believer makes a difference in the believer's life, preserving that believer from decay. On, of the believer in Jesus, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20, supporting passage here. He says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. In Matthew 3, 11, Jesus, re- or it is referred to this Uh, Matthew refers to this, I should say, uh, this quote from John the Baptist in prediction of the coming of Jesus Christ. Matthew 3.11 is recorded saying, I baptize you with water, said John the Baptist, right? This is him speaking. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul also says to all believers in Jesus, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, the representation of the cleansing fire of the Holy Spirit salts a believer in preparation for being a living sacrifice to God. This is why we are not our own. We're purchased with a price. You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, you've given your spirit to him, you believe in him, and you've asked him to take your sin away and to fill you with his presence, you no longer belong to yourself. You belong to God. And the Holy Spirit cleanses and salts a believer. You know, there's a scripture in Leviticus chapter 2, 13, with instructions to Israel in the preparation of their sacrifices that they were to give to God in the law of Moses. Now, we all know that the law of Moses, now maybe we don't all know, but if you read the Old Testament, the law of Moses was a precursor to what was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And in Leviticus 2.13, the scripture says, season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to all of your offerings. See, sacrificial salt is a symbol of the covenant relationship between God and his people. Every disciple of Christ is salted in sacrificial preparation for God and the mingling of that person's spirit with the fire and salt of the Holy Spirit. You see, you become a vessel that has been cleansed, that God dwells in. The human heart 
salted by the cleansing presence of the Spirit, avoids the judgment that is upon all sinners. This is why the Scriptures teach us that even though our sins be red like scarlet, they, may, they are made white as snow when the blood of Jesus Christ washes away our guilt. The sacrificial blood of Jesus was given so that he died instead of us so that we could have life. In the context of these verses in our text, Jesus is saying that the penalty of sin, what he's saying, the penalty of sin is eternal death. So sin needs to be purged from, drawn out, and burned from the human heart by being salted by the presence of God in us. Our sins are washed away by the blood of the Lamb, allowing a clean vessel to become a place where the Spirit of God can dwell, because God cannot dwell inside of a sinner. The sinner must be cleansed. Does that make sense? The Holy Spirit can't live inside a dirty vessel. That means what you can be do good all you want, follow scriptural principles, and follow the law in the Bible as, as closely as you want to, and you will never be clean enough to be acceptable to God. You will never be clean enough. The penalty of sin is death. Yes, there's different consequences to different sins in this, in this realm, but the final consequence is that if there's a little sin, the consequence is death, because God is so holy that he cannot be in the presence of sin. That's why he gave so much to make a way for us to be cleansed in him, that's why Jesus is so important. And when we come up to the Passover and Easter se season, it's so important for us to understand that without the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ, we are dead in our sins and are subject to judgment to follow. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And a young lady came to me this morning and said, you know, I learned John 3, 17 is important too. And yes, the son of God did not come into the world to, to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's part and parcel with John 3, 16. God's desire is not for judgment, but for salvation. That's why he gave so much. But he was rejected, despised. But to everyone who believes, he gives eternal life. Jesus says salt is good in verse 50. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. So what is he saying here? Jesus is saying that salt is good. He already has already mentioned it acts as this preservative, preventing and drawing out infection. It acts as flavor too, if you... Add it to food. I like a little salt on my, maybe more than a little salt on some of my food. My wife would go, hey, you're taking too much salt. I like salt. Good. Makes things taste good. But I think the Lord is trying to tell us through what he is speaking to his disciples about that the presence of the Spirit draws out the infection of sin in them and preserves them when referring to salt in this passage. The nature of sodium and chloride you know, sodium chloride. It's a compound. It's a very stable compound, actually. You can't easily separate uh, sodium and chlorine. You, th when they're sodium chloride, they're very stable. As a matter of fact, the only way that you can um, okay, reduce the saltiness of the salt is, uh, there's two ways. One is to uh, give it an electric shock to a certain degree. I'm not sure, I'm not a chemist, but if you shock the sodium chloride uh, compound, you can actually divide the chlorine and the, and, the, uh, and the sodium. But mostly, like if you just take it from a practical point, how do you reduce the saltiness? By watering it down. By watering it down. You see, in its natural state, the adding of water does not change the salt's compound 
at a molecular level, molecular level, but it dilutes it, reducing its effectiveness as a preservative. Case in point, you know, I've, I make smoked fish at home. And uh, if you put a lot of salt in the smoked fish, you can keep it out on the counter and it'll stay good for a long time. Dry it out, it'll stay good for a long time. Salt acts as a preservative. But if I uh, did my brine and I didn't put salt in the brine or I diluted it to the point where it just barely got it infused into the, into the fish, I couldn't keep it out very long before it would spoil and I'd, whoever ate it probably get food poisoning because the bacteria growth would, would be in excess of what the salt content was to able to draw that away. Now maybe I'm... What, what, I, what I'm saying here is, you see, we preserve, infect, preserve by drawing out infection, we also add flavor, and, and for us to lose our characteristic of being salty in a good way, the gospel would have to be diluted in our lives. Well, a complacent Christian permits, I guess you could say, how would you put this? It permits a rainfall fall of other philosophies and ideologies to permeate, per, permeate them. So if you're, if you're a complacent Christian, you allow outside influences to permeate you and water down the salt. A, a, a complacent believer who does not protect the truth of the gospel inside them, but opens up and is permeated by this other, these other philosophical ideas. Sometimes people like to combine their Christian, uh, you know, their ideas. Okay? This is, it's important for us for this salt to get into our heart, to become part of us. Okay? Because if it's just head knowledge Christianity, oh yeah, people, I've talked to people who combine it with, you know, some things from the New Age movement or maybe from Hinduism or um, Buddhism, Islam. And then and there's the various forms of American culture, you know, the immoral culture and the, you know, hedonism, I guess, love of pleasure and the pursuit of pleasure at, all thing, at the cost of all things, it's most important for me to be happy and to do what makes me feel happy. You know, that philosophy. You mix that, those philosophies, with, the, uh, with Christian ideology, what you end up with is something that's diluted that does not, in fact, preserve anything. I don't know about you, but I want the influence of the gospel to be effective in and through my life. And I think as, as Christians, we ought to be asking God, Lord, help us to represent you and your teachings in the way that I live in such a way that I'm not this diluted brine that's barely a brine at all. Because that doesn't have any influence. Salt losing its saltiness. Are you allowing things around you, what you watch, see, hear, participate in, are you allowing that to dilute the, the power and influence of the gospel in your life? This is kind of what Jesus was talking about, about hot, cold, and lukewarm, right? He wants us to be salty in a good way. Um, my son would probably, yeah, salties, that's not a good... Well, I, they've got different terminology in youth culture now than what we used to have, but, you know, salty isn't always good, but salty in this sense is really good. Or perhaps I'm a professing Christian and, and I become a skeptic, saying that I believe in Jesus, but I don't want to make any changes in my life, acknowledging that there might be some truth in the Word of God, but not wanting to commit to it, only holding partly to it, not fully giving my heart to it. You know, skepticism is like an electric shock to the truth contained in the Gospels, breaking down its preserving and life-giving qualities. And this professing Christian is really no believer at all. Rather than producing saving faith in Jesus the size of a mustard seed, it creates a doubt the size of the Grand Canyon. And, and this brand of Christianity, it's good for nothing but to be scattered upon the ground and trampled under the feet of man. As a matter of fact, on their own, the elements of salt 
if you break down salt into its natural elements, sodium and chloride, have you guys ever seen what happens when you throw a piece of pure sodium into water? Poof! Blows up. How about chlorine? I think they use it as a weapon in one of the wars, right? When, they're, when chlorine, when salt, the compound of salt is broken into these two elements, it becomes both toxic and volatile. So what Jesus says when he says, have salt among yourselves, he's saying that allow the good qualities of what God has placed inside you to act as a preservative in both your hearts, but also in the church. When you mingle with other believers in Jesus, make every effort to spur one another on to love and good deeds and strive to be at peace with one another. There's so much conflict. There's so much trouble out there in the world. The Prince of Peace is our King. And like-minded unto Him, we ought to be people who are peacemakers. Amen? Blessed are the peacemakers. The Apostle Paul caps all of what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples in our text today, and I'm going to conclude with this scripture. I think it's really important because it ties in. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 to 11, the Apostle Paul writes to the church, saying, You are all children of the light and children of the day who do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then... Let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of our salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. So my friends, I know there's a lot of people that are encouraging others around them to love and good deeds and to be part of what God is doing here. Continue to do that. Don't be afraid to step out and give that cup of cold water when God directs you to. Maybe he'll ask you to do something bigger than that. But out of a heart of love for one another, build each other up. God didn't appoint us to suffer wrath. If there's something that's entangling you, take it seriously. Turn it over to Jesus. Let it go. There's power in Jesus' name to give you life so that you can walk in a way that's pleasing to him. That's why he gave of himself, and that's why he gave you the Holy Spirit to change you, to resurrect you what was dead, and bring life so that you can become a life giver no matter where you go. Amen? I'm going to ask the musicians to come forward. And as we pray, we're going to pray and then um, and we're going to sing that song, Highly Exalted, again. So would you bow with me in prayer? Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for your life-giving sacrifice that made a way for us to be at one with you. You died instead of us. You took the full penalty of our sins upon your shoulder to make a place for us with you so that we could be at one with the Father. God, we ask God that you'd help us Help us to keep our eyes on you and to be salted in a good way. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would, would move in and through us to do your work and that we would yield to your Holy Spirit. And as we yield, Lord, that we would not fulfill the desires of our sinful nature, God, 
but that would be put to death and that new life would come and that everything we do, Father, would be glorifying to you. Forgive us for the times, Father, where we stumble. Help us not to be a stumbling block for anyone else and cleanse us, God. Fill us, Lord. We need you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us and who you are. God, as each person goes home, may their hearts be filled with your love and your joy and your peace. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.